The following presentation is from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Aren't this the first Sunday of Lent? And rather than being something we find in the dryer or your belly button, as the case may be, <laughs> Lent is a word that means spring. And uh, a word that we look towards this time of year. It's kind of a spiritual spring feeding, if you will as we prepare ourselves for the Easter season. It's a time of year, uh, it counts 40 days, not counting the Sundays, so 40 days between last Wednesday, which was Ash Wednesday, leading us up to Easter, and except for Sundays. And we don't count the Sundays because each Sunday is, in, is in, uh, considered a mini day of resurrection. And so that's what we celebrate each Sunday as we come to rejoice that we do celebrate our living Lord. But this is a time of year to focus on our spiritual practices and spiritual disciplines, to make room in our lives for God to work. So we do that through fasting and through prayer, uh, through almsgiving, giving to the poor, giving to the needy. Uh, we do it by meditating and, and reading God's word and, and taking special time within this season to draw closer to the Lord and allowing him space for his spirit to work in our lives. And so that's what we commit ourselves to. And today we begin this journey by looking at some uh, Old Testament text and looking at some covenants in the Old Testament. Today we'll look at the covenant of Noah and we'll continue in the next couple of weeks to look at some covenants here. And as we do that, I think the Lord has some things to show us as I've grappled with this text. Some weeks it comes easy and this is one of those weeks where I was grappling a lot with the text, but hopefully it will all come together and, and make sense. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful. Thankful to be in your presence. We thank you, God, for that love that we have sung about, that love that will not let us go, for your promises, that we can stand on those promises because you are a faithful God. God, you are faithful this morning. And we thank you that we can come before you on this Sunday and, and worship and exalt your name, knowing that as we've gathered together in that name that you are here among us. And we ask that you would minister to us by the power of your Holy Spirit, that we would allow us to hear your word, to apply it to our hearts, and to help us to become, during this Lenten season, the disciples, the men and women that you're calling us to be. For we ask it in the precious and holy name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, violence is again on the front page of our newspapers. We find ourselves again in a place of sadness, anger, and pain in the aftermath of a mass shooting. Seventeen individuals were killed and more were injured at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida on Wednesday. Violence has altered or ended the lives of children, women, and men. Violence has violated the sanctity of human beings. And it has always been this way. It has always been this way. I say that not to excuse or to minimize violent acts, but as a statement of fact. A statement of fact, it has been this way since the earliest times. It's been this way since the earliest times. And what grief this has caused God. This is not who God made us to be. This is not who God, us, God made us to be. And that's why it's very interesting that the story of the flood in Genesis begins with God being sorry. The flood begins with God being sorry. Oh, we know this story well, don't we? We know it from Sunday school. The Lord told Noah there's going to be a floody, floody, get those animals out of the muddy, muddy. And Noah didn't wait for his ship to come in, but he built one. That's right. He built him an arky, arky, built it out of the gopher, barky, barky. And the animals, they came on, they came on by twosies, twosies, elephants and kangaroosies, roosies. I know you want me to go on, don't you? But, but I won't. On the surface, it seems like a fun children's story. But it is a strange story, isn't it? It's a strange story. It's full of death and destruction. And we always focus on the cute little animals and we tell the kids this story. But we don't talk about all those other human beings and creatures who perished and drowned in this flood. It is a violent, destructive story. But the book of Genesis doesn't spend too much time concentrating on Noah and the animals. Genesis' emphasis is on God. Genesis emphasizes God. 
And the image of God in the flood story is best described as that of a grieving or pained parent. God is like a grieving parent who is distressed over what has happened to the human race. The NIV Bible says it well, that God's heart was filled with pain. God's heart was filled with pain. The basic character of the human heart is described in Genesis 6-5. It says, every inclination of their hearts was only evil continually. Every inclination of their hearts was only evil continually. And that is said alongside the disappointment and the sorrow-filled response of God's heart, of the divine heart. The wickedness of humankind has deeply touched God. So much so that God repeatedly regrets in these chapters that he has created human beings in the first place. He says, I regret that I even made them. Right at the very beginning of the flood story, Genesis makes clear that this God is in genuine relationship with the world. This God is in genuine relationship with the world. And because this relationship is genuine, God is deeply and personally moved by what happens in the relationship. In other words, God is not removed and detached from the world, but God is involved with and affected by his creatures, both human and non-human. What we do, the ways in which we live, affects God. God is impacted by it. God isn't like some divine mechanic that is just trying to fix our problems from the outside. But God makes himself vulnerable. He involves himself in the brokenness, and he works on the situation from within and alongside of us. Well, God was so disappointed. So disappointed and brokenhearted over what this creation had become because of the corruption and the violence of humankind. That's right, the sin that he singles out, the sin that Genesis singles out in chapter 6 is the violence. That is the one sin that is singled out. And because of the violence and the evil hearts of humankind, God decides to blot from the earth every living creature. Every living creature. There will be no exceptions. God will eradicate everyone and everything. But even in the midst of this dark story, we find good news. We read about a man named Noah. Noah is described as a righteous man. And God told Noah about the plan to destroy the earth and to make an end of all flesh because of humankind's violence. But in God's very next breath, he tells Noah to build an ark. It's as if God can't even think of destruction without immediately coming up with a plan of salvation, a plan to save the earth and the flesh that he created. We know the next part. We know how Noah builds the ark and he brings in the animals. The heavens burst open, the rains come down, the flood destroyed the mess of corruption and violence that creation had become, and every living thing that was on the face of the earth was blotted out. Every little living thing except for Noah and those who were with him. Genesis 8, 1 says that God remembered Noah. God remembered Noah. And when God remembered Noah, God sent a wind over the earth. Just as a creation, there was a wind that hovered over the deep. Now there was a wind that hovers over the earth. And that wind is the same word as the Spirit. The Holy Spirit hovered over the earth. And what happens? The water begins to recede. And eventually Noah and his family and the animals go out of the ark. But here's the thing. Here's the thing. When Noah and his family, when they all got on that ark in the first place, something was smuggled on board with them. Something was tucked away in their hearts. And that thing that was smuggled on board, that thing that was tucked away in their hearts, was the seed of violence. The seed of violence. You know that human beings are said to be just as sinful after the flood as before. Genesis 6, 5 was the text I read earlier about the evil inclination of our hearts. That was before the flood. After the flood, in chapter 8, 21, it echoes the same thing. It says, for the inclination of the human heart is evil from youth. The inclination of the human heart is evil from youth. Think about that. If the violence and evil of sinful hearts causes God sorrow and heartache, that's what the story tells us, that God's heart was broken, because of the sinfulness of human hearts, then pain is an ongoing reality for God. Pain is an ongoing reality for God. 
God chooses, however, to continue to live with us, even though we are resisting creatures. In fact, God goes so far as to make a covenant with Noah. But not only with Noah, this covenant is actually made with every living creature of all flesh. And the essence of this covenant is never again, never again. In Genesis, our text for today, Genesis 9, we find God's promise to Noah and all the people and the creatures and even to the earth itself. It is a covenant with all creation. And God promises never to do it again. He promises never to do it again. The text of the covenant requires nothing whatsoever of creation. It sets limits only upon God. God said, says, as for me, I will never, 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 he says it three times, I will never again send a flood to destroy the earth. Noah doesn't say a word. It's only God. Never again will humanity be the recipient of God's judgment in this way. Not that humanity will never again deserve punishment. Not that we won't deserve punishment for this bloody, violent world in which we make our way after the flood. But this story is about the goodness of God, not the potential goodness of humanity. From Genesis 9, the story follows in which God keeps coming back to humanity. Time and time again, God comes back to humanity, even though humanity turns from God. God continues to make and to keep promises to people, even when those people have broken, they have not kept their promises to God. God continues to love us, even when we break our promises to Him. And the most basic purpose of the flood story focuses on God and God's commitment to the world. What God does here is that, is that he qualifies the workings of divine judgment. God will never do this again. God resolves never ever to destroy again in this way. And to help God abide by that promise, he does something interesting. He hangs a rainbow in the sky. A rainbow as a heavenly reminder of the covenant. It's very interesting. Did you ever notice that? We often think that the rainbow is a sign for us. But the rainbow actually is a sign for God. God says, I'm going to put this rainbow in the sky so that when I look at it, I will be reminded of the covenant I made with you. There may be those who wonder, why on earth does God need a rainbow in the heavens to remind him of his promise not to give up on the human race? But when you think about all the death, and all the destruction that we wreck on each other, we can be grateful that God has a rainbow to remind him not to give us what we deserve. And I want to say, God, keep your eye on that rainbow, right? God, keep looking at that rainbow. But it's interesting, in Hebrew, and it's in our text, the word for rainbow is actually bow. Bow. The bow that hangs in the sky is the kind that shoots arrows kind that shoots arrows. But this bow is empty of arrows. And the dangerous part, the string that can fling the arrows, is turned to the ground so that it is unable to do any harm. God takes his bow. God takes his bow, his weapon of violence, his option of destruction, and God hangs it up. God retires it God promises never to use it again. God hangs up his bow in the clouds and promises every living creature that the destruction of the earth and all living things is now off the table as an option for dealing with the sin and the brokenness of the world. God hung up his bow. But we wonder, we wonder what will God do about the violence and the corruption? What will God do about all those things that break his heart? and that break our hearts. Well, let's hit the fast-forward button. Hit the fast-forward button a few thousand years to another story. It's found in the Gospel of Mark. This story begins with what seems like a title. Mark 1-1, the beginning of the good news. This is a good news story. I don't know about you, but I could use a good news story. So many of our stories are full of sorrow and destruction and death. In fact, sometimes we look at ourselves and the world around us and we tend to wonder, is God... Is God still, is he, he's still sorry that he ever made us? I imagine there are some days that he is. But this story is not just about any good news. It is about the good news of Jesus Christ. 
the Son of God. God hung up his bow. Destruction was off the table. But God had another plan. God had another plan to deal with the violence and the corruption of the earth, and it was all wrapped up in Jesus, God's Son. In this story, instead of floods of destruction, it's the waters of baptism. And the waters of baptism bring wholeness and cleansing. Jesus came and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And in his baptism, the heavens were torn open. Just as the heavens were torn open at the flood. And Jesus was identified as the beloved Son of God. And the Holy Spirit, the wind, the spirit that was present at the flood, is now present when Jesus is baptized. And it descended on him like a dove, which was also part of Noah's story. But then all of a sudden we find the beloved Son of God driven out by that same spirit into the wilderness with the wild beast being tempted by Satan. The good news story gets a little dark for this part. It was 40 days and 40 nights that the rain came down and the floods came up in the story of Genesis. And now Jesus was the one braving the storm in the wilderness for 40 days. Instead of all living creatures being destroyed, one man, God's Son, was preparing to take on the sin of the world so that through him all of creation could be reconciled to God. The violence and the corruption and the evil inclinations of human hearts, Jesus was going to be tempted to join it. That's what Satan does at the temptations of Christ. He tempts him to join in the world's way of doing things and the world's way of power. He tempts Jesus to use it and to embrace it. But Jesus was with God and they had hung up the bow because there would be another way. And after his 40 days in the wilderness, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God and saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. God has hung up the bow. Jesus has come proclaiming another way. The kingdom of God has come near. And the kingdom of God, it turns out, is a no bows needed kind of kingdom. In fact, in order to become a citizen of this kingdom, you are called to hang up your bow as well. Rather than fighting or destroying our enemies, we are called to love them. Rather than to protect our own lives, we are called to give them up. We are called to take up our crosses and to follow after Jesus, the beloved, who sacrificed his life for all of creation. Now, many of Jesus' disciples, many of his disciples in his time and still today, have struggled with the concept of hanging up the bow. Like the rest of humankind, we find ourselves inclined towards violence, wrapped up in corruption. Sometimes we find evil in our hearts. We get caught up in this cycle of revenge. But Jesus has come. Jesus has come. The kingdom of God has come near, and we are called again to repent, to change direction, to turn around, and to believe in the good news. You see, Jesus is the embodiment of God's words to Noah, never again. Jesus is the embodiment of God's words, never again. And on Good Friday, on Good Friday, we tested God's never again to its absolute limit. But God's never again held firm on that day. Even when we sought to destroy him, God kept his promise not to destroy us. You see, Jesus is coming revealed who God really is. Never again can we say we don't know the true character of God because we look at Jesus and we see what God is like. Never again can we say we don't know. And sadly, the way that we treated Jesus revealed who we really are. But the good news is, is that there is another way. God has made the way, and Jesus calls us to it. Violence and destruction and retribution and revenge are no longer necessary and ultimately they will be destroyed not with more violence, not with more destruction, not with more revenge, but with the love and the sacrifice of Christ and in the power of the kingdom of God. The last word, the last word will not be our sin, our violence, our destruction, but rather the last word is God's awesome love. The story ends in good news. 
Because God is determined to have the last word in our story. God continues the conversation and sent His Son calling us, calling us to turn away from sin, to hang up our bow, to embrace His kingdom, and to follow Him. And that's what this season of Lent is all about. The season of Lent is about following and heeding Jesus' call. It's about turning away from sin, turning our back on sin, hanging up our need for revenge, our need for violence, our need for, to, to get retribution, to get even, hanging all of that up and embracing his kingdom, his kingdom of love, his kingdom of forgiveness, his kingdom of service, and following the path after him, following him all the way to the cross where he laid down his life for others. And it's only those who travel the way of Jesus it's only those who travel this way of Jesus through the chaos of Good Friday and the silent void of the grave who can hope to see the Easter dawn. But when we see the dawn of that morning, that light will reveal a rainbow in the dark western sky behind us. And for that we say, thanks be to God. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word this day. We confess, God, that like the people in Noah's day, we, we have evil in our hearts. We look around in our news and in our lives, and we know this to be true. Our lives are characterized by sinfulness and violence and corruption. We thank you, God, that in this story, as you sought to cleanse the earth from these things, that your final word was not a word of judgment, but a word of grace. And that you hung up your bow so that we could follow your example, so that we could put away our evil and our violent and our unloving tendencies and follow the path that you have blazed before us. We thank you, God, that in the fullness of time you sent your son Jesus, he who became one of us, that you weren't afraid to be in complete and total relationship with us, enough that you would become one of us and that you would walk alongside of us, you would resist the lore of violence and resist the lore of sin, and that you would perfectly live to what we needed so that you would pour out your life on the cross. Now, God, you call us to follow your example to be people who follow your way, the way of love, the way of forgiveness, the way of service. God, I pray that you would forgive us of our sin, that you would allow us to repent and to follow and to embrace your kingdom message. We need your Holy Spirit to enable us, oh God. And I pray, God, for a fresh outpouring of your spirit during this Lenten season, that you would help us to be the disciples that you are calling us to be. We thank you, God, for your love. We thank you for your kingdom. And Lord, we thank you for this good news. In the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen. The preceding presentation came from St. Paul's United Methodist Church in Oakland, Maryland.